Good morning. On behalf of First Presbyterian Church of Fairfield, I say welcome to those who are here in the sanctuary and for those who are watching online. Whether you are a member of the church or here for the first time checking out this rather terrific place, we will extend to you a very warm welcome. Let us now enter into a time of worship. We gather here in anticipation, seeking an encounter with our holy God, who comes among us when we least expect it, like Jacob, who invites us to wrestle with our questions and doubts, who richly blesses us and calls us each by name. Let us encounter and worship God together. Please stand if you are able. Hymn number 118 can be found in the blue hymnal. Please be seated. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Please join as we say the prayer of confession, saying together, Merciful God, the story of Jacob shows your willingness to enter into the messiness of our human struggles, into fractured relationships, family differences, unreconciled situations with people we care about. Yet we confess that too often we hold on because we do not want to loosen our grip on our possessions and our selfish desires. Help us to wrestle with conflicting values, 
desires, and pressures that confront us daily so that we may unclench our hands and open ourselves to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Only then can we fully embrace others in their pain and be embraced in the name of Christ. Please take a moment to silently confess your sins to God. Heavenly Father, thank you for the powerful story of Jacob, who learned that it was not by his might or power, schemes or wit, that he was blessed, but by your grace. And thank you that it is not by our might or power, good works or good character, that we are saved, but by your grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. In Jesus' name, you are forgiven. If you are able, please stand for the Gloria Patri. Please be seated.
Good morning. Is it safe to say good morning on this lovely spring morning? Are we in spring? I, th I hope so too. Um, it's just such a blessing to be in the house of the Lord on a day like today. And we do have a, a blessing. Uh, we have a guest preacher. And Courtney, you can't see them, but many of them who hear me preach every week are really smiling. Their, their faces lit up when they heard guest preacher. Uh, Courtney Verady is currently serving at Neroten Presbyterian Church in Darien, Connecticut, one of our sister churches. She's also serving as a chaplain at Norwalk Hospital. And she serves with my brother-in-law, Pastor Gary. And Pastor Gary has told me, you, you have to hear Courtney preach. Um, and so we, I, I was blessed to hear her at 9 a.m. this morning, and God really used her. And I know that the Lord is going to continue to use you uh, to bless his people with his word. And so why don't we offer, make, make Courtney feel comfortable, why don't we offer a clap offering of praise to the Lord for Courtney this morning. All right, good morning. It is a joy to be here with you all this morning. Thank you to Pastor Greg. Thank you, um, First Presbyterian Church, for having me. So, we are going to continue our journey through Genesis this morning. Um, so before we start, let's pray, and then we'll dive into God's word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this new day. We thank you for the sunshine out the windows for the birds that are chirping, and for your mercies which greet us each and every morning. As we study your word together, we pray that you would transform us. Keep changing us more and more into the likeness of Christ. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so last week, Pastor Greg unpacked Genesis 27 with you all, if I remember correctly. He was talking about the blessing for dysfunctional families. Did anyone find their own family in that story? <laughs> Any dysfunctional families among us? Well, the story that we are reading in Genesis, it really reads like a soap opera. There's deception, trickery, costumes, concealed identity. You may remember from several weeks ago, the story starts with Abraham, a man that God calls to leave his land, to leave his nation and go to a foreign land where he doesn't know where he's going. Pastor Greg reminded us that Abraham was of retirement age when he was called. And retirement age is not normally when we move to a foreign country to start a new venture. When God calls Abraham, he makes a promise to him. He promises that Abraham will become a great nation, will be blessed by God, and through Abraham's offspring, literally the word is seed, that all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So this promise is made first to Abraham, then it's passed down to his son Isaac, and eventually it's passed down to Jacob. So before we get into our text today, I'm going to give you a brief rundown of the highlights of Jacob's life. So this is the spark notes of who Jacob is. And a lot of the stories may be familiar to you. They're quite iconic, many of them. So we'll do Jacob 101. So Jacob is the second born twin. His twin brother Esau comes out first. When Jacob comes out, he's grasping his brother's heel. And so his name becomes Jacob, which means heel grabber or deceiver. As the second born, Jacob would have less privileges. In that culture, the firstborn son got the power and the privilege and the wealth passed down to him. But he buys his brother's birthright for a bowl of stew. I don't know about you, but I would love that recipe. <laughs> Whatever stew was good enough to sell your entire privileges as the firstborn, it must have been pretty delicious. Later in his life, we have more trickery when together with his mother, Rebecca, Jacob dresses up as his brother, this was last week's text, and tricks his father into giving him the blessing intended for Esau. So by this point, Jacob has already tricked his brother out of his birthright and his blessing. Now, if you were Esau, how would you be feeling? Not too happy, right? So Esau, uh, Jacob hightails it out of there. 
Esau's not thrilled, conflict is brewing. Jacob hightails it out of there, goes into exile for 20 years. During this 20 years, we have the famous bride switch. He meets his match in Uncle Laban, Uncle Laban the trickster, who tricks him into marrying his, old, his older daughter Leah and then his younger daughter Rachel. The final iconic story we'll look at is Jacob's Ladder. You may be familiar, this has been immortalized in art and music. Jacob has this dream when he's on the bank of the river and sees, sees angels ascending and descending a ladder. And during that dream, God reaffirms the promise made to Abraham. So, that's Jacob 101. When we arrive in our text today, Jacob has left with the land where he met Uncle Laban and is returning to his homeland. So he hasn't been home for 20 years. He hasn't seen his brother for 20 years. And they didn't leave on the best of terms. I wonder what Jacob would have been thinking and feeling in this moment. Perhaps some of us can imagine, perhaps some of us know what it's like to be estranged from a family member. Perhaps some of us know what it's like to be away from a town or a country that you love. We read in the beginning of chapter 32 that Jacob is afraid and distressed. This makes sense. We would be too. What's interesting is how Jacob responds. We see a twofold response from Jacob. He prays and he plans. That's not a bad first takeaway for us, is it? What do we do in response to complex life situations? First, we can use the faculties God has given us and plan, make a plan for how to address the situation. And second, we pray, or first we pray and then we plan. That's probably a better route. We submit those things to God. We invite the God of the universe to come to enter into our circumstance and to guide us. So after making his prayer and planning his strategy, Jacob sends his family, his flocks, and his belonging across the river and stays the night alone on the riverbank. And that's where we pick up our story today. So I invite you to read along with me. The scripture is printed in your bulletin. Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32. This is the word of the Lord. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he replied. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we're going to ask three questions of the text this morning. First, what do we learn about Jacob? Second, what do we learn about God? And third, how does this point us to Jesus? First, what do we learn about Jacob? Well, Jacob has perseverance. He sticks it out when the going gets tough. We read that this wrestling match lasted all night. That's a very long time to wrestle. He kept going even when he was injured. He wouldn't even let go of this wrestling partner until he received the blessing. 
Earlier in his life, we also saw his grit, his perseverance. He worked seven years to marry Leah, another seven years to marry Rachel. Even in the womb, we read that the brothers were wrestling. Jacob has perseverance. Second, we see that Jacob has spiritual insight. He recognizes at some point that this person he's wrestling is not merely a person, but is God. Now, pages have been written about the identity of this person. Is it God? Is it an angel? Is it a man? Is it Esau? We're going to follow Jacob's interpretation, and Jacob's interpretation is that it is God. God's presence in some way mediated through this wrestling partner. So with that, question two. What do we learn about God from this wrestling match? First, we see that God comes near. To wrestle with someone requires proximity. Jacob is in a messy situation. He's fled from his uncle slash father-in-law, not on great terms. He's with his two wives who don't get along terribly well. And he's going back to see his estranged brother who he hasn't seen in 20 years and who he cheated out of the two most important things in his life. Messy. Yet in this messiness is precisely where God meets Jacob. And the same is true for us. God meets us where we are in the midst of the complexity of our past, the messiness of our present, and the uncertainty of our future. God draws near to us in the midst of our mess. Second, we see that God wrestled. I wonder if God came with the intention of wrestling. Was God coming just to bring comfort, companionship, encouragement, and Jacob picked a fight? We don't know. But what we do know is that God was willing to wrestle with Jacob all night long. There's a word here for us as well, whether our wrestling is physical or a spiritual kind of wrestling, that our God comes to us with love and a willingness to wrestle. Third, God hits him where it hurts. In verse 25, we read that the man touched the socket of Jacob's hip. Now, in Hebrew, it's a bit more vivid, shall we say? Rather than simply touching, the Hebrew word has a sense of strike or punch. And the location of this punch in Hebrew is the hollow of his upper thigh. So I'll leave that to your imagination, but let's just say he was most likely hit in a place that would hurt quite a lot. And this actually matters theologically. Because the original blessing that was given to Abraham was all about the seed, this biological language that in your seed, into your descendants, all the peoples on the earth will be blessed. And Jacob's whole life, he's been going around trying to get the blessing. Trickery, tricking his brother, tricking his father, trying to get the blessing his own way. The, the Bible Project is a wonderful resource. I'm going to quote from them here. They talk about this. Quote, God shows up to wrestle with him and punches Jacob in the groin, the biological source of his fruitfulness. Because Jacob won't receive God's blessing, God wounds him in the place that allowed him to generate his own blessings. Jacob wrestles God for the blessing that God intended for him all along. A summarizing picture of Jacob's life. The irony here is huge. He's wounded, but this wounding is more akin to resetting a bone than it is to slicing someone open. It's a hurt that brings about greater healing. And what is that healing that is brought about? We'll see that in the rest of the passage. It comes in two parts, renaming and eventually blessing. Verse 26, even after being wounded, Jacob is still in the fight. He's still hanging on. The man says, let me go, for it is daybreak. Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. 
naming would have a twofold significance in the ancient world. First, to name something or someone is to have authority over it. We saw in Genesis chapter 2, Adam is given authority to name the animals. This is a way of showing that he has, has a level of authority over them. Second, a name in the ancient world had a deep connection to someone's identity and character. So right now, Jacob's name is Deceiver. And we see here God gives him a new name. He says, you're no longer going to be called the Deceiver. Your new identity, your new name is God Wrestler. And in this, we see God's authority also. God is the one who has the authority to transform Jacob, to make him into a new person. We have this same idea in our New Testament, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So God comes near to Jacob. God hits him where it hurts, changes his name, and finally, God blesses him. But it's not until after Jacob tries to kind of one-up the angel. The angel, God, asked his name, so he says in 29, please tell me your name. But he doesn't. He says, why do you ask my name? And then he blesses him. This blessing he's been wrestling for and tricking for and working for his whole life is given, as we heard earlier, as a gift of grace. Not because Jacob was worthy, not because he kept on the fight, but because of grace. So how does God encounter Jacob? He comes near, he wrestles, he wounds him to heal, he renames him, and he blesses him. Our third question, how does this story point to Jesus? This is my favorite question to ask of the Old Testament. How does it point us to the person of Christ? Well, 2,000 years later, a great, 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 great grandson of Jacob's will draw near to a messy and complex people. He will be wounded far worse than a dislocated hip. His ultimate wounding will bring us healing and blessing and renaming. Philippians 2 tells us that Christ Jesus, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ draws near. Christ wrestles. Christ is wounded so that we could be renamed and blessed. So for you and for me, where do we find ourselves in this story? If you think about your current season of life, your current walk with the Lord, are you encountering God? Perhaps you're coming to know God as the one who meets you in the messiness. Perhaps you're wrestling with God and learning that God is strong enough and loving enough to carry the toughest challenges we bring to him. Maybe you're experiencing wounding, loss, pain, and wondering how God could possibly be in the midst of that. Maybe you're being transformed you're seeing God give you a new identity and change you from the inside out. Maybe you're receiving the blessing, the love, the grace, the goodness, the kindness of our God and sharing that with others. The invitation of this text is for us to consider how God might be inviting us to lean into him. This text shows us that our God is not a distant, far off deity, but a God who comes near a God who loves us enough to wrestle. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for being the one who draws near to us. We thank you that our biggest questions and our biggest challenges are not too big for you. Lord, we pray that as we journey through our life of faith, that you would continue to rename us 
continue to transform us. And may we, Lord, be a conduit of your blessing to a world that so desperately needs you. We pray all these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand, if able, as we say our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As God's people, we are called to bless all people by praying for the needs of the human family, our church family, and our families. So let us pray together by saying, we pray to the Lord. Let us pray. That those in our families and extended families would be reconciled through the grace of Jesus Christ. Together we say, we pray to the Lord that we would overcome our pride, our shame, and our fear to bless those in our family and our community. Together we say, we pray to the Lord. Where there is anxiety, anger, and despair, help us to wrestle with you, Lord, and to come away with your love, your power, and your blessing. Together we say, we pray to the Lord. And we thank you that through Jesus Christ that we are given a new name and a new identity. For those who have not yet heard you say their name or have come to know their identity in Jesus Christ, together we say, we pray to the Lord. For the recoveries of Bruce Tomasco, Diane Tomasco, Bill Fair, Linda Brikes, Richard Bellos, and others not named, together we say, we pray to the Lord. We ask for your comfort, your peace, and your strength for Don Brown, Nancy Stackhouse, and others in this room and beyond these walls who are hurting. We say together, we pray to the Lord. Let us now say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to say by praying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning again, church. We are excited with what the Lord is doing 
among us and through our church family. Uh, if you would like to be involved with what God is up to or would like to receive prayer, there is a next step card in your pew. We invite you to take out that card and to fill out your information. We'd love to say hi to you after the service and thank you for coming as well as to write down your prayer request. I'll be praying for that request this week. A few things that I want to draw to your attention. Uh, we are in a season of growth in our church by God's grace, and many of you are re-exploring church or Christianity for the first time, and you feel like this church has become your church home, and you want to make it official. And that's why we do church membership. If you feel like God is calling you to follow Christ within this church community, you can just write membership on the back of your next step card and we'll get you plugged into the next steps. Also, we have a opportunity to serve out in our community on the back of your bulletin. You will see the flyer and the QR code for Habitat for Humanity. This summer and this fall, we will be building a home with a family from our local community. If you'd like to get involved with that building project, you can write Habitat for Humanity on the back of the card. And ladies, our, our moms, our grandmoms, our aunts, um, our single ladies, you are all invited to our women's retreat that is happening in the month of April, April 26th. It's happening just down the street at the Moore House. I've been to the Moore House on retreat. Uh, it is like being transported to a peaceful, calm, uh, spirit-filled world. They will take great care of you ladies on this retreat and we expect that you will come away from this retreat with a greater sense of Christ's love for you and deeper friendships with other Christian women. If you're interested in the women's retreat, you can write that on your next step card and we'll get you plugged in to that retreat opportunity. And finally, we have a, a joyful announcement today. Uh, today is the day that Megan Anderson is beginning her ministry as our Christian Education Director. Megan, would you stand and would you just, yeah. Thank you. We, we pray, the kids prayed for Megan at our first service today, and we've been praying for you, Megan. And we're just so excited about Megan because she just radiant, radi, she is just the radiance of Christ's love and joy. And she is the radiance of Christ's love and joy for our children. And one thing that you know about our church, if you know anything about our church, is we are invested in the next generation. We care deeply for the entire family. We care deeply for our children and our grandchildren and all the members of our community who are children. We want them to know the love of Jesus because we know this. The love of Jesus transforms families and it transforms generations. And so God bless your ministry, Megan. We are here to support you, to partner with you on this important work of the Lord. And finally, your next step cards and your offering can go in the offering plates in the back of our sanctuary on our way out. Let us now continue our worship of God by standing and singing our doxology and our closing hymn, number 464. Four. 